clean and green, Singapore will start importing electricity from Malaysia in a two-year trial. Piloting the use of rapid tests, more than 200 conference participants swabbed for COVID-19 STs. Tim Go was there. It's a lot faster, less painful, um, less uncomfortable than the previous PCR tests I've taken. And over in Malaysia, what's next for Prime Minister Muhyiddin after the King said there's no need to declare an emergency at this time. Hello, you're watching The Big Story coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. I'm Harianto Dimana. You can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. We begin with the latest COVID-19 situation in Singapore. Three new cases were confirmed today. There were no new community cases, but there was one case from a worker's dormitory. The remaining two were imported, who had been placed on stay-home notices when they arrived here. More details will be announced tonight. Also making local headlines, measures like air filtering and distancing between passengers are making air travel safer, but passengers should still take precautions when flying to avoid catching COVID-19. Infectious diseases experts noted that getting infected from someone else on board cannot be completely eliminated. Their comments come after findings from the International Air Transport Association this month stated that COVID-19 transmission risk on board planes appears to be very low and that infection figures are extremely reassuring. But the World Health Organization has said that the lack of extensive documentation of in-flight transmission does not mean that it does not happen, although it also noted that the risk appears to be very low. A baby weighing just 345 grams, about the weight of a soft drink can, was possibly the lightest infant to have survived premature birth in Singapore. Now on the road to recovery, six months later, Nur Zaya Naziza Muhammad Salfi is now 4.27 kilograms. At six months, she is on par with an infant of about two months old, which is to be expected as she was born four months premature. Born after just 23 weeks and six days at the National University Hospital, she could fit in the palm of a hand and her limbs were the size of an adult finger. Well, she will be undergoing regular checkups to make sure all is well. Industrial estates will soon be lush with more greenery with the number of trees set in these areas to almost triple in the next 10 years. These estates will have 260,000 trees by 2030, up from the current 90,000, as part of the One Million Trees movement. National Development Minister Desmond Lee said that the tree planting efforts will be complemented by a network of environmental sensors that will collect data on ambient temperature, relative humidity and wind speed. The data will then support ongoing research projects and help the authorities develop better greenering, green, greening strategies to cool Singapore. Well, a greener energy mix is something Singapore is striving towards by taking multiple steps like a pilot to import electricity from Malaysia. In his opening remarks at the Singapore International Energy Week, Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh said Singapore hopes to tap green energy from around the region through regional power grids. The groundwork for this will be laid through an electricity import pilot with Malaysia over two years. Well, Singapore will also ramp up its drive to tap more sunshine here with the goal of achieving 1.5 gigawatt peak of solar deployment by 2025. This is an acceleration of the solar deployment plan that Mr Chan announced at last year's conference, which was to have an installed solar capacity of 2 GWP by 2030. And over the longer term, Singapore could also potentially tap emerging low-carbon technologies like using hydrogen as a fuel or deploying carbon capture utilisation and storage to suck, so to speak, planet warming carbon dioxide out of the air. Well, joining us now to talk about these initiatives is science and environment correspondent Audrey Tan. Hello, Audrey. So, several steps announced today to push Singapore towards greener energy sources, including importing electricity from the region and ramping up efforts to harvest solar energy here. But I want to find out from you how significant is each initiative in contributing to our overall efforts to have a greener energy mix? So, yeah, hi guys. Uh, as you can see, I'm still here at the conference venue, which is why I have my mask on. But yeah, a number of initiatives were announced today um, to help Singapore green its energy mix. 
So a bit of background before we get into the meat of today's announcement. Singapore currently um, is powered by mainly by natural gas. It is the, a fossil fuel, but it's still a fossil fuel nonetheless. So Singapore has announced today uh, various initiatives to try to green its energy mix. And it includes um, increasing the amount of solar panels we deploy here in Singapore. But even then, that is still limited. So the plan now is to meet 2% of our energy needs in 2025 with solar power. So 2% is still not as high as we would like, which is why um, Singapore is also trialing importing electricity from Malaysia. Uh, the Energy Market Authority has said that they would prefer a renewable energy source in Malaysia. And the reason for why this pilot is significant is because it would you know, set the groundwork for Singapore to import uh, more energy sources, I mean more green energy sources from our neighbouring countries. So Singapore, we may lack access to certain forms of renewable energy, but our neighbours don't. So setting the groundwork will pave the way for Singapore to import more of these green energy sources in the future. And lastly, another announcement that was made today is uh, a new research initiative, 50 million, almost 50 million, uh, will be pumped into development of clean energy uh, technologies in the future. So that includes using hydrogen as a fuel and also carbon capture, utilization and storage technologies. So such, solution, such solutions um, basically aim to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so that uh, it can be captured and stored or converted into other useful substances. So if you look at it um, and holistically, all these are parts of a puzzle that would help Singapore uh, mm. paint a greener future in terms of our energy use. Right. Uh, Audrey, do these uh, greener energy alternatives eventually translate to lower electricity prices for Singaporeans? So I guess one of the electricity, uh, one of the greener energy solutions that we would be able to see soon would be the import of electricity from Malaysia. So mm. that the EMA is anticipating that um, by the end of next year, 2021, we could be importing electricity from them. However, the amount of electricity electricity that we hope to import is 100 megawatts, so that just makes up about 1.5% of our peak energy demand today. So the EMA is uh, saying that because the amount is not too much, it is unlikely to affect um, energy prices here in Singapore yet. But we'll have to see how, you know, in the long term this will pan out. And that is one of the reasons why we are looking at this pilot in the first place, to see uh, not just about the technical capabilities, but also in terms of the market um, market prices and other consumer sensitive kind of points. Yeah, of course. Well, Singapore International Energy Week is until Friday. So, Audrey, what else uh, can we expect from the conference? Any other big announcements? So, we are probably expecting to see more MOUs being signed. I mean, that is the point of such um, big energy mm -hmm. conferences, you know, bringing minds from all over the world to meet. Uh, already, some MOUs were announced today, including tie-ups between Singapore and uh, Australia. But, uh, I guess the more, more information will be revealed as the conference progresses. Right. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on to the show, Audrey. It's a pleasure to always speak with you. We've been speaking to our science and environment correspondent, Audrey Tan. Well, the Singapore International Energy Week is also the first convention here where participants must undergo pre-event COVID-19 swabbing using antigen rapid tests. Journalist Timothy Go went through the entire process. Hi, I'm here 30 minutes early at the Marina Bay Sands Expo and Convention Center to register and take my test. Now, I'll get my results in about 15 minutes via SMS, and if I test negative, then I'll be able to head inside. So let's go. So I just took the antigen rapid test. It's a lot faster less painful, um, less uncomfortable than the previous PCR test that I've taken. In this case, the swab only goes slightly up your nose. You really don't feel it as much as in the other tests. And I honestly think that this is something that might be very useful in the future uh, if we were to expand it to other events. If it has to be done, it has to be done. So it's, 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 not, it's not painful or anything like that. Um, like I said, it's just a little bit ticklish, so it's, it's not, not too bad. The R shows, they were very helpful in the instructions and everything else, so I'm um, pretty satisfied. I, I was actually quite afraid of the swap, but he's, he's quite nice and then he explained to me and then it's, yeah, it's smooth, not too uncomfortable, it, it felt like a sneeze. In addition to the tests, attendees were to remain masked and abide by the safe distancing measures. This included staying one metre apart from each other and sitting at tables of up to only five people. Pre-event tests are part of the Ministry of Health's pilot to enable the reopening of more activities, including large-scale events. 
If successful, they may pave the way for looser restrictions on group sizes for gatherings, which are currently capped at five. Timothy Goh for The Straits Times. Well, lots of developments out of Malaysia over the weekend and today in a special meeting this afternoon Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin and his cabinet discussed the King's rejection of a request for him to declare a state of emergency in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Muhyiddin's proposal included a suspension of parliament where he governs with a razor-thin majority and faces a leadership challenge from opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim. Also, it comes ahead of a vote in November on next year's budget. Now, the Prime Minister's opponents claim he's using the pandemic as an excuse to stay in power. Malaysia Bureau Chief Shannon Teo is back with us with the latest. Now, Shannon, we're seeing a series of meetings today. Details are scarce at the moment, but what can you tell us? Well, these meetings, of course, follow one that was held at the Prime Minister's residence last night. He was uh, in, uh, in, in close and deep discussion with uh, allies and advisors in his residence all the way up to midnight last night. Now, this follows, obviously, the royal rebuttal of his request for emergency. Following that, this morning, Prime Minister Muhyiddin met party leaders from his ruling Perikatan Nasional before going into another special cabinet meeting. We recall they had one on Friday, which made the initial request for an emergency. Mm. Now, we don't exactly know what has in the result of those discussions. What we do know now is that UMNO President Zaid Hamidi is now in a meeting with Barisan National MPs. Now, Barisan National has 42 MPs, and if they pull out of Rikata National, then within Yassin is no longer Prime Minister, he doesn't have the majority. So it is a very fluid uh, situation right now. Um, UMNO MPs are saying that the meeting is about discussing whether they still continue to support Tansri Mohidin. Um, one of the uh, on the backdrop of this is, of course, that the king said that he is pleased with the current government and he wants politicians to stop undermining it. So the question now is whether Ammo is going to make a decision which is contradictory to this decree. Well, Shannon, let's uh, go back to what happened over the weekend. So we know that the king rejected Mr. Muhyiddin's emergency bid. In your analysis, though, you wrote that Mr. Muhyiddin still has the royal endorsement. But what does that mean for the prime minister? Well, I think that what the King has said is that it's not right to hold an emergency just to deal with the COVID situation because we have the necessary uh, laws. We've been doing it for the past six months. We've been handling the COVID situation. We've been keeping the numbers relatively low, the deaths relatively low. So we have the tools already at our disposal to handle it. Now, if the emergency is about a political situation, well, the King has addressed it. He said that I'm pleased with what this government has done and I want politicians to stop undermining it. I want MPs to stop being irresponsible uh, by trying to undermine uh, this government. And he made specific reference to budget 2021 that is supposed to be tabled next month. Now, if the budget is defeated, then of course the government collapses. And he's made specific mention that this, this budget is very important and we should put aside political differences and support it. That's what the King has said. So it is in effect, an endorsement from Muhyiddin in the short term. Uh, and I joked with some friends that it's like giving you a free Netflix trial for a, a month or so. And after that, we'll see what happens, whether you like the product. Mm. Now, in the same vein, Shannon, what does this mean for Mr Muhyiddin's opponents, uh, namely Anwar Ibrahim and even Mahathir Mohamad? Will they attempt to have a go at Mr Muhyiddin again, even with the King's endorsement? Um, I think right now it is always very politically costly to try and uh, contradict a, a royal decree, whether at state level or at national level. Um, the, the popular sentiment must be so strongly with you to attempt something like that. Um, of course, uh, Mahathir has done things like this when he was in power uh, 20, 30 years ago. He was so popular back then that um, he did clip the wings of the royals uh, many times. I doubt that he will try again now. Um, purely because uh, there is no certainty about who has the numbers, who has the majority. I think Anwar Ibrahim has uh, issued a, a kind of a non-committal statement, but our sources are saying that in PKR, they don't feel that it is also the right time to try and uh, topple the Muhyiddin government, mm -hmm. unless the Prime Minister himself chooses to resign. Um, his ally, his, his, Anwar's largest ally, DAP, is already making very loud uh, noises about uh, supply and confidence deal 
to support the budget. As long as Muidin is willing to make certain concessions, is willing to discuss and uh, go into a committee to, to discuss what is more most important uh, for the country in this budget. Right. Well, Shannon, as you know, Parliament is set to take place in a week on November the 2nd. What could happen between now and then, though, and even on the day itself? Well, I think for those who want to see uh, the King's decree carried out, to see that the government does not collapse and that the budget is passed, uh, we'll see a lot of negotiations, a lot of horse trading, perhaps even all the way up into next week because the budget only has to be tabled on Friday on November 6th. So we've got about 10 days for politicians in this country, policymakers in this country to come to a deal which pleases enough and peace uh, for the budget to pass. But of course, uh, politically, a lot can happen. There might be people who say, well, I, I don't want, I don't care about the budget. I just want to change the government. Uh, it also depends on whether the king is willing to swear in a new prime minister, even if someone else had the majority. Or do we go into what everyone's been trying to avoid, a snap election in the middle of, you know, what is the third wave of the coronavirus outbreak in Malaysia? Okay, good to speak with you as always, Shannon. That was Malaysia Bureau Chief for The Straits Times, Shannon Teo. StraitsTimes.com has all the developments from across the causeway. Still on Malaysia, the country will host the first ever virtual summit of leaders from APEC nations in November amid the political uncertainty. Doubts had arisen earlier in the year if the summit would go ahead due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In a statement, the International Trade and Industry Ministry said Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin will chair the Economic Leaders Meeting on November 20th, which will have the participation of all 21 APEC economic leaders. The summit is expected to launch the region's post-2020 vision, the key policies set to replace the Bogor goals which will reach maturity at the end of the year. Elsewhere, China reports 20 new confirmed and 161 new asymptomatic COVID-19 cases following a surge in symptomless infections in the northwestern Xinjiang region. The Chinese National Health Commission said that all new confirmed cases were imported infections. Of the 161 new symptomless infections, which China does not classify as confirmed cases, 138 were locally transmitted. In Australia, lockdown in Melbourne will be eased after it had gone 24 hours without an, any new infections for the first time in four months. With infections now under control, Victoria State Premier Daniel Andrews said most restrictions would be eased in two phases from tomorrow. People would be free to leave their homes and restaurants, cafes, shops, bars and hotels would be allowed to reopen. But capacities at those businesses will be kept at 40 indoors and 70 outside. The size of religious services would also be expanded. Typhoon Malave struck Philippines today, bringing heavy rains and gale force winds that inundated villages and forced over 100,000 people to evacuate. Those forced out of their homes are from El Bay province and elsewhere across the Bicol region. Disaster response officials have yet to release a full accounting of the damage. Malave is currently a Category 1 typhoon on a 5 category scale, with 5 being the strongest, and is expected to strengthen over the South China Sea as it heads towards central Vietnam. Well, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Hariyan Tadiman with Olivia Kuei. Thanks for watching and we'll see you tomorrow on The Big Story.